design is a process like philosophy, like science, like technology and mathematics and any other engineering uh, protocol. It's a process of looking at a problem, addressing what causes that problem possibly and what possible solutions there are to a problem. And then it goes about reinventing and reworking and reassessing and reevaluating until there is a possible solution to the problem. When that possible solution is identified, the next step in design protocol is to actually build a prototype for that solution and test it and retest it. A process of taking something from its existing state and moving it to a preferred state, design aptly relates to extreme life extension. It also relates to the adaptive processes of the human species. In the human use of human beings, Norbert Weiner states, the human species is strong only insofar as it takes advantage of the innate adaptive learning facilities and its physiological structure makes possible. Organisms anticipate the future, choose routes to take, and then adjust their behavior accordingly as, quote, every organism exhibits some degree of aim or purpose, unquote, thereby becoming a model. Such a model can be seen in what Alfred North Whitehead provides as a vision of behavior. Also, such a model can be recognized in Weiner's scientific framework of cybernetics and the potential for organisms to be viewed as formations in assessing technological advancements. Notably, quote, a living organism is no longer seen as a permanent form, but rather as a network of activity. With this new definition of life, the philosophy of becoming supersedes the philosophy of being, and life becomes a process bound to a notion of change. There. Let's look at design adaptation and the state of the art of human futures. Well, consider a human prototype where the human body and brain are modified by the user as in the uh, human future in the center. That's a prima post human I designed in 1997. Okay, so if a design is a social process and it uh, uh, relates to social progress and it relates to possibly the, the synergenic aspect of the human incorporating with machines and technology, what does that mean exactly? For design, in the biological arts, the idea of molding or sculpting our body is as essential as working on a painting or working on a sculpture. For cognitive scientists and neurosciences, looking at the brain and looking at what causes the cells to degenerate, what causes those synapses and the dendrites to connect, what causes the telomeres in our chromosomes to lose their ends, these are all aspects of looking at the design process of the human body as it ages. Well, in the biological arts, there's enormous potential for not only the robotics, the, um, the um, neurologists, the designers, the nanotechnologists, all working with the information, nanotech, cognobrick technologies. How does this convert? What does this mean to the process of design as it affects extreme life extension? Whether or not modifying or enhancing the human is advantageous is is a deep and problematic ethical issue, especially right now, and it's, as you know, it's in the news and it's discussed tremendously. What are the ethics of our doing this? Well, as I'm concerned as a designer, I look at the design and the potential of the design. My job is to problem solve this issue that I've identified as aging and death and the, the, um, the discontinuity of uh, personal identity. That's the problem as I see it. And as a designer, I go about to look at what type of technologies and processes can be used to alleviate that problem. I have to team up with other people, of course, in other professions. So then I came up with Design on the Brink, the biotech, robotics, infotech, nanotech, cognitive neurosciences. Put together, these, these different disciplines are working. I'm not the first one doing it. I'm not the only one doing it. It's become a major field within the arts, and it's becoming a field in industrial and product design. While I may have designed the first prototype, uh, <laughs> medical scientists and surgeons are far ahead of what any artist or designer could possibly do right now and I don't make any pretense there. However, what is missing in those domains is the creativity and the understanding of what the problem is. I don't have to look at it strictly from a philosophical point of view or a scientific point of view. I have the, the ability to roam in my imagination looking at what possibilities there are. So, um, 
the state of the art with design futures is basically that a, a little bit of poetic license, understanding the ethics as well. What is the relationship with extreme life extension and design? As a process, design is intention-based. We solve a problem, develop a method for solving the problem, and go about testing it. The relationship between design and extreme life, uh, life extension can be identified by using these three steps. First, the problem of cell apoptosis. The second, the problem of analyzing and researching what technologies and sciences are available to us. And third, putting them into action. I have some slides uh, later I'll show you on this, um, some very creative interpretations. One of the main issues here uh, is the fragility of the human body and especially the fragility of the human brain. Uh, the brain's dynamic library of experiences is so fragile that we have to consider what possibilities there are for backing it up. Just as we back up our computer, our brain uh, needs some sort of mechanism to give us the, the um, well-being that our memories are being preserved. Well, we have tape recorders. We have um, video cameras. We have all sorts of artistic mechanisms to do that. But what if we wanted that integrated within our brain? Yes, there are, are possibilities for chips and, and immersive design and environment design and all sorts of interesting mechanics for that. But what if we look at it from a different perspective, not as technology and communications, but looking at it as an enhancement of the human brain? Um, then it becomes a whole nother area, a whole nother domain. So the sustainability of memory then becomes a central issue. We had death, which is the formation of why design would be in involved or related to extreme life extension. But if we look more deeply into it, it becomes memory. Because in memory, is that where our personal existence resides? And if so, isn't that very precious? And if not, why is it not? If we can preserve our personal existence through our memory, then why aren't we doing it? Why are we sustaining the environment and sustaining as much as possible but not sustaining ourselves? So there is the, the key question. What is it in human nature that doesn't value personal identity, the individual, the being, the species, as primary um, situation or issue that we must pay attention to immediately? Well, one of the issues there is the practice of a religion and spirituality or any other type of um, a ritual that looks at our afterlife and puts more emphasis on our afterlife than our, our being life. So um, if we look at possibilities of death and redefining it, then we get into a whole other issue. Throughout mythology, um, whether it's going back to the Bushmen uh, in Africa, who are said to be the, the first um, humans, uh, the Bushmen worshipped an underworld. In Egypt, there was the afterlife. In uh, different religions, in the Navajo Indians, it's the, the four corners and going to um, the, an underworld in the earth, more of, in line with the Gaia spirit uh, belief. Um, Christianity, of course, Judaism, all the different religions have a belief about the afterlife. So if we place our religion and spiritual views above our real-time views, then of course it makes sense. Why wouldn't it? That's where our value is. But if we, those of us who don't or want to place value on both possibilities, then the existence of our personal identity and sustaining it, continuing it, has great value for us.